you got your Bible this morning, turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. This morning, we're going to focus on the cross. We're going to focus on the Lord's Supper, our Lord Jesus, and what He has done for us, what He is doing through us as believers in Christ. But we just want to go back today, and we want to give Him glory. We want to give Him honor, and we give Him praise for who He is. I love the the songs, the worship that we, we sang this morning, a man about the blood of Jesus and, uh, and how the broken can come and be healed. The broken can come and find hope. I don't know about you, there may be some broken people here this morning. Uh, every week when I come and preach, I try to say something uh, around the fact that you never know how people walked in here today. We come in and sometimes we look real good and we dress real good and, and inside our lives are falling apart. They're broken. They're stained by sin. They're scarred by the sin of others. The disappointments of life, the, even the idol worship sometimes that we're a part of that we think something on this planet is going to bring us hope or going to bring us fulfillment when everything on this planet leaves you empty and void without Christ at the center of it. And so as we come today and we approach the Lord's table, I I thought it would be good for us just to take a few moments and focus on what takes place at this table. This just isn't where we take of the fruit of the vine and we take of the bread and there's something happens or should happen when we come to this table. So in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verse 19, verse 20, and Jesus took bread and gave thanks and and broke it. Can we just take a moment and just try to imagine that scene? Jesus is introducing what's getting ready to happen at Calvary. And understanding that the loaf of bread that he picks up to use as an example And as he breaks that bread, understanding how that he will be broken on Calvary by the sin of the world being placed upon him. And it's it's hard sometimes because I can just read through it and not realize that this is the master. This is Jesus telling us what's getting ready to happen to him within just a few hours. And Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks. Well, there's one way we approach the table, isn't it? We give thanks, Kenny, for what God's done for us. We give thanks for that body. And he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, uh, nope, there, by the way, the invitation of Jesus. He, He breaks the bread and he invites the disciples to join him in this. And he, he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, understanding the substitutionary death of Christ for you and I. This body is given for you. You and I should have been put on that cross. We're the guilty sinners. We should die, and yet Jesus gave his body for you, and we are to remember the sinless body of Jesus Christ that he voluntarily laid down on Calvary for you and I. Likewise, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. When I think about this, and in your notes I noted in the introduction, Jesus used the occasion of the Passover to identify himself. He identified himself by his actions, by his words, as the sacrificial lamb. He further expanded the messianic and the prophetic meaning of the event of the Passover. Christ's words and Christ's actions initiated this celebration of this powerful symbol. And it's interesting to note the the early church practiced it in Acts chapter 2, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Even in Acts chapter 20, some 15, 20 years later, now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul 
ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message. Get the note there until midnight. Some of y'all think I preach too long. You would not invite the Apostle Paul to come to your worship service and begin a message that he will finish at midnight that night. I love that. It makes me just look much better than what I am, I'm telling you. In your notes, the Lord's Supper not only carries historical significance, but also theological significance in that it symbolizes the sacrificial death of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper, not only does it fulfill history, but theological significance, it symbolizes what Jesus did in sacrificing His body on the cross for you and I. The bread and the fruit of the vine, they symbolize the very blood and the very body of Jesus Christ. There's something going on. There's a symbolic nature. He said the bread, that, that represents my body. He said that the fruit of the vine, that represents my blood. And each time that you take of these, you will remember. Now, I note for you the blood being essential to his earthly life, and by the way, all other life, was shed redemptively for our lives. He redeemed you and I, and there was a cost. Uh, Peter would go on to proclaim the value of the cost. He would say something like this, For we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. At that day, the two most precious things they had on the planet. But we were purchased. We were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So as we partake this morning, we, we realize that this represents his death, his burial. It represents his resurrection. This hones in particularly on what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary. Now, there's a special note that I made. Wayne Gruden wrote a, a great book on, uh, called Systematic Theology. He, he pointed out that the church reaps the benefits earned for us by Jesus' death. And that we receive spir spiritual nourishment for our souls through the Lord's Supper. Listen to John chapter 6. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh, drink my blood, abides in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me lives because of me. Now, there's some lessons we learn here. The table that we're invited to today affirms his love for me, and he invites me to come to this supper. This table is an invitation for whosoever will to come and partake of Jesus Christ. My partaking of the meal affirms my faith in Jesus Christ. So by partaking today, I, I want to make sure we're real clear, really clear on this. this. This is not a religious thing we do. This is because of a relationship with Jesus Christ. When I come to the table through his invitation, which is the only way anyone will ever come to Christ, Christ calls them and they respond to the call. But when I come, here's what I'm saying. I believe, I believe that body was broken for me. I believe the blood was shed for me. I believe Jesus is the Savior of the world. And finally, in bullet points there, we got a couple more, sorry. I am redeemed, and I am accepted by Christ's actions, and my, my actions proclaim it to others. Remember what Paul wrote to us, one of my favorite verses that we always associate with the Lord's Supper? For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So when I come to the table through His invitation, 
I'm one saying, yes, I am a follower of Christ. I'm an unashamed follower of Jesus Christ. He died for my sins. He took my place in a substitutionary, sacrificial death on Calvary. And by the way, he's coming again. That's what that table symbolizes. Now, there's a special note that says, the celebration of the Lord's Supper also carries that prophetic significance as it commemorates a past event, it anticipates the future consummation of Jesus Christ coming. Thus, in your notes, a feast of love and fellowship, a memorial of faith becomes a prophecy of hope. And listen to me, friend. Today, the world needs hope desperately. Because when a world runs out of hope, they run to suicide. They run to despair. They generally run to, the, the, to what I would call the dark side. When they don't see the light of hope shining from the church, shining from you, shining from me, they don't see it. They turn and they run. Now, in just a couple of closing notes, and then I'm going to give you some really things to chew on as we get ready to take this table today. No matter how confident we feel about ourselves, this is just in closing. We're all human. Everybody all right? Just put a little star next to that and put right down this. None of us are as good as we think we are. Everybody all right? Not a one of us in the building are as good as we think we are. That simple. All of us, Paul said, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Secondly, no matter how devoted we may be to Jesus Christ, we will all fail at one time or another. And if we don't understand the invitation taking place at this table today, we will walk away from the Lord because we've got into a legalistic set of rules of do's and don'ts. God wants to take all your do's and all your don't, don'ts, and he wants you to bring them to this table today and give them to Jesus and walk out of here set free. Religion, friend, will bind you. Jesus will loose you and set you free. I pray today that you understand this significance. As we come to this table, we understand uh, when we read even in the book of Acts about the disciples taking and partaking of bread and taking the Lord's Supper. And when we look at those 11 that are there now, and Paul will join them shortly, we realize that every one of those guys were rebels. Every one of them abandoned Jesus in his hour of greatest need. Every one of them deserted him. Not one, all of them. In John 21, they were, they, they, gee, Peter said, uh, hey, fellas, I'm, I'm going fishing. Now, that don't mean anything to us in the English language, but in the Greek language, here's what it said. I'm leaving my current occupation. I'm going back to what I used to be, a fisherman. I'm done. I have failed, and God can't use me anymore. And if you remember the, the next scene in the middle of John 21, guess what? Jesus has already started a fire on the shore, and there he's cooking some fish that he's caught, and he brings some bread with him and the guys look over and there's jesus inviting them to come home it's interesting the last thing most of those disciples smelled before they walk off and departed jesus was the coal of fires that they were warming themselves by and what does jesus do he brings them right back to that same scent and says listen you don't have to stay here you can walk out of here fresh and clean. You can walk out of here in fellowship with me. Peter and the disciples could have allowed the past to control them, to dominate them. Please understand, Peter and the disciples have no uh, corner on disloyalty or denial. They haven't cornered the market. They haven't cornered the market on what it feels like to be lonely and or at times willfully abandon our Lord and our Savior. They know what it was like. 
but they don't have the monopoly on allowing the past to dominate their present. And Jesus walks into your life and my life today and says, uh, are you allowing your past to control you today? Or are you willing to walk out of here clean and set free from it? See, you know you're allowing the, the past to control you when you focus on what's been done to you, first of all. Sometimes there have been some awful things that have happened to us by the sins of others. And man, I mean, it, it can, if we're not careful... We can focus on the pain that that has caused and, and, and all that has happened. And, and what happens when we focus on what's been done to us, it, it, it keeps alive hurt. It, it keeps alive anger in our life. It keeps alive revenge in our life. And we will either remain a casualty or a victim for life if we're not careful. So let me ask a, a, a piercing question. What identity markers is the enemy using to crush your spirit? What things have happened to you in your past that if you're not careful, that's all you'll dwell on? Hope says that you can be a survivor and you can be an overcomer through the blood of Jesus Christ. So sometimes we, we, we focus and we, we, we don't feel like we even we're a child of God or how could we be a child of God if something like this could happen to us. But secondly, we focus on what we've done. Hey, listen, everybody has got a skeleton in the closet. Everybody okay? If you go home today and he's still there, uh, that's your fault. After today, it'll be your fault. Because skeletons, you're supposed to bury. So if you got one hanging around in your house, just call Stephen King. He'll make a movie out of it. And everybody's got one. You, you haven't always dressed this way. You haven't always looked like this. Everybody's got one. And if we're not careful, we will carry the shame. We'll carry the guilt with us. Let me say it again. The only thing you can do with guilt is one of two things. You can rehearse it or you can release it. Aren't you tired of living it over and over and over again when you can give it to Jesus and he can take it away? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when I come to this table, I can't focus on what's happened to me and if I focus on just what I've done and I don't allow Jesus' blood to give me peace in both, then I will feel as a pastor I've failed to communicate the message of hope to you. There's another way that you can, can do all of this and allow the past to control you. You begin to rely on a lot of uh, what I would call just uh, coping mechanisms to get through life and help you exist. Your dependency turns to stuff. Sometimes it's how many toys you can collect. And tragically, at the end of collecting all those toys, you're still empty and you're still void. Sometimes you can turn to alcohol, to drugs. Uh, I, many people will turn to the Internet and feel like they now are building relationships with people. Instead of relying upon our intimacy with Jesus Christ. How can I be set free from all this junk? This, this relying on everything else to try to make me happy or, or, or maybe um, relying on all these other kind of things to help set other people free that doesn't work. Well, there's, there's two or three ways. Number one, you come, you come to the table... And you admit the fact that you're absolutely powerless to do it. Everybody okay? There will come a point in our lives, and all of our lives, where we run to the end of our rope. And at the end of the rope, Jesus has been waiting there for us. He's just waiting. It's happened in my own life with my own daughter. He's waiting for me just to say, are you done trying? You can't change things. 
Doesn't matter. You can't buy people out. You can't love people out. All you can do is turn them over to me and let me go to work. Are you ready to do that? And it's at that moment Jesus set you free. Just like that. Confess you're powerless. Sometimes you have to shift from self-condemnation. Where did I fail? Where did I go wrong? What should I have done different? All these kind of stuff. All of a sudden, you move off of self-condemnation and you allow the Holy Spirit of God to do a self-examination upon you. And man, when he begins to go in and search you and try you and cleanse you and get all this gunk out, then he's able to heal your heart and you walk out of here free in Jesus Christ. Man, that's good preaching, Pastor. You go, boy. Many times you understand the past is controlling you when, when you try to overcome and heal in your own strength. And we've talked about it for a moment. See, here's what happens. I wrote this last night. Your past remains a part of the present and your future is chained to it. And unless you break that chain right here at this table, you'll drag it with you for the rest of your life. I watch people who lost their virginity to someone when they're teenage years, and they're 40 years later, they're still running in guilt and, and laden, or people who've had abortions and the tragedy of being deceived or some fine time just willfully doing it. And all of a sudden, 40 years later, people are still bound to the fact that they don't believe they can be forgiven. This is an invitation of cleansing today. And maybe you've set up a lot of idols in your life and... Um, those idols have resulted in a bunch of empty promises. Just empty promises. Empty promises is all that the enemy supplies. Celebrities, sports figures, many times our own body image becomes an idol to us. Sexual relationships that have left you to weep alone, getting caught up in the cult of money and having to have it technology and getting involved in all of that and thinking that you're going to build, quote, unquote, friends through staring into a computer screen and all the emptiness, the loneliness that it provides in a broken spirit. What can you do to be set free from junk like that? Come to the table today and declare absolute dependency upon Jesus Christ to heal you and for your future to be productive in Him. I've been teaching the last couple of weeks our teenagers, and this has been the verse that we have focused upon. Most of them are in the next service, and, or they would help me on this, but here's what we've been focusing upon. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And are you trusting today Jesus with all of your heart, or have you segmented him in to your life? Uh, Jesus doesn't want to be a piece of the pie, friend. Jesus is the pie. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Listen, and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. And what does the Bible say? Here's the conditionary promise. Three statements and a conditionary promise. And he shall direct your paths. I trust in him with all my heart. I don't lean to my own understanding. In all of my ways, God, God we're going to do this thing together. And he promises to direct my paths. Father, as we approach this table today, may this table be a table of hope and cleansing. May it be a table designed by you for fellowship. And I pray that no one walks out of here today broken, feeling they cannot be forgiven, feeling that there is no hope because Jesus, this table is about hope. This table was offered to men who he knew would walk away from him when he needed them the most. He knew would deny his name. He knew would, who would curse him out around a campfire. This table today is offered to sinners who need a Savior. So, Lord, use this time of fellowship, I pray. This time of spiritual cleansing, I pray, to draw us close to you, to bring people home today. And I pray it in Jesus' name.
Amen.